If, you, if anyone wants a pleasant job, this industry is not for you. If you're in this for comfort and stability, go find a desk job, go or be comfortable with your salary. No matter how hard or little you work, you can jump on your hamster wheel and work your way up your corporate ladder. I laugh at this, I'm gonna be, so you're guilty, I'm guilty of this. So we hire people on and we're basically like, all right, I figured it out, but now you get to go you reinvent the wheel. And nobody helped me do it. So you no. figure out, call me if you need uh -huh. me, because that's what I used to have to do. Exactly. No one really knows what to do. So one or two things happen. They either work really hard and put in the time, but they're doing all the wrong things, or they have analysis paralysis and they've never been in this kind of role where they have this autonomy. So they just don't work. YouTuber, educator, and influencer, the roof strategist, Adam Benson is with us today on the Claims Game Pack podcast. I admire this guy and respect this guy so much. He's been able to put together something that is just incredible in regards to sales and roofing strategy so that you could build your business and really grow your market and really hit your sales goals like a lot of roofers want to do and frankly a lot of public adjusters want to do as well. He's going to give you some really great tips. I even tried in the in the in the conversation. I really also tried to just sort of uh, say, hey, you're a public adjuster and you're getting this objection. What do you say? And it was really cool uh, what he was able to provide us with information, but also a lot of his processes, his sales processes, his sales techniques, how he's broken everything down into like a formula is really incredible. And if you're, if you're into sales at all, you're going to love this podcast. And if you're a public adjuster and you're having trouble with objections or you're having trouble with getting that uh, signature uh, signed on the dotted line, this podcast right here alone is going to help you. It's a short podcast where we just provide you an enormous amount of value. Value. So make sure you check this out. Also, of course, remember to check out our podcast, a Claims Game Podcast, and our website, www.commercialclaimsadvocate.com. But without further ado, check out this killer podcast with my friend, Adam Benson, the roof strategist. Welcome to the Claims Game Podcast with Vince Perry. Get all the tips you need from insurance claim advocates and professionals and grow your public adjusting career to the next level. And now the commercial claims advocate, Vince Perry. Okay, okay, okay. I am so excited about this episode because I have been following this guy for a very long time now. Unfortunately, I have not had the pleasure of meeting him in person, but you know, sometimes in this new day and age, it's almost as good meeting somebody here on a live Zoom and looking at him in person. Listen up, advocates, whether you're a public adjuster, contractor, or an attorney, if you have a client that has suffered any kind of catastrophic loss, whether that be by fire or storm or just any catastrophic loss that requires your client to have to move out and incur ALE and loss of use coverage, you need to think about looking at Black Diamond Services. This is an incredible idea for a service that I think is extremely valuable and I've actually personally used uh, for my clients myself. Basically what they do is they provide all of the necessary money that need is, is needed to be done for the homeowner uh, to go and move to another place, whether that be a hotel or another home or whatever it is, they basically bill through their insurance policies, loss of use coverage, and basically they provide financial assistance so that the insured never has to incur any out-of-pocket expenses. It's an amazing service. I love the people at Black Diamond Services, especially Millie Varela. If you just contact her and contact Black Diamond Services, I'm telling you, they're going to take care of your climate clients like you wouldn't believe. I personally have a client who suffered a fire damage and had to use their ALE coverage, and all we did was refer them to Black Diamond. Our clients did not have to come out of pocket a single penny. Black Diamond prov provided all of the financial um, uh, money, and they provided the actual location for the homeowner to stay. Amazing service. Contact Black Diamond Services today so you could find out more information for yourself. And um, well, Adam, I'm really excited to have you on. This is Adam Benson, the roof strategist. Adam, thank you so much for coming on, man. Yeah, Vince, thanks for having me. It, it's overdue. So I'm glad to be meeting face to face here and uh, diving into all things sales. It is totally overdue. Uh, it seems like every conference that I go to, you don't go to. Every conference that you go to, I don't go to. So we haven't been able to meet in person yet, but I am, yeah. I am fairly positive that that opportunity is going to come uh, fairly soon. It will. It so- will. Um, again, I'm very excited to have you on because of a lot of reasons, right? I mean, for uh, from a social media standpoint, I'm happy to have you on because I do social media as well. And I'm probably going to pick your brain a little bit about that and about your experience throughout all that. But then also as, um, as, a, as a business owner of a public adjusting firm, one of the things that I feel most public adjusting firms lack in that roofing companies do not lack in is actual sales training. 
you know, one thing with roofing companies, their main thing, I feel, I don't know, I've never, ha- I've never had a roofing company, so I don't know. It's just what I see, obviously. But I feel like one of the main things is that door-to-door sales, getting those deals, landing those deals, get out there, get after it and do it. Where in the public adjusting community, we do door-to-door, but it's a little bit more complicated in regards to rules and regulations that we have as as public, as licensed public adjusters. Sure. And also a lot of it for us has always been like, we're the quarterback of your insurance claim. We're not going to do the repair. We're not going to do all these things. We're just going to sort of look after you. And we tend to go more towards the building relationships with the roofing contractors, with the general contractors and with all these different people. So I'm excited to have you on because I'd like for you to hopefully maybe teach us and my audience here a little bit about about sales, about pitching, about getting these deals and so on and so forth. So that's why, those two reasons why I'm very excited to have you on. Well, I dig it. All good things we're going to jump into. Sweet, sweet. So first, before we get into it, could you tell me a little bit about yourself, Adam? Tell me sort of how you landed in all this, how you sort of got started and how you yeah. are sort of where you are at today. Sure thing. It was a, a journey that's probably similar to most. Um, roofing attracts folks who are looking to rebuild their lives in a better way. And most folks don't come into this from a really good spot in their life. So I was... Uh, This was back in 2011. I was following my passion, like people tell you to do. I studied natural medicine, ended up moving to Madison, Wisconsin, and starting, uh, attempting to start my own practice. And meanwhile, being a massage therapist and working for uh, one of the franchises you'd likely know that is horrendous to work at, pays you literally a poverty level wage. I was earning under $20,000 a year. And uh, it was a family holiday. My family was two hours away. I couldn't afford gas to go visit them. So I had to ask my mom for 20 bucks for gas for my tank in my 20s, which was not a good feeling. It was the most demoralizing and demasculating moment of my life. And funny enough, I was actually talking to my mom about this the other day over dinner, and she didn't even remember it. She didn't even remember it because <laughs> as a mother, you just help. To me, it was like literally the most pivotal, pivotal moment in my life. So on the drive in, it's a two-hour drive. I, I called up my mom to thank her. And on the phone, uh, my stepdad had been in the roofing industry. And he says, hey, you can earn six figures selling doors or selling roofs door to door. He's like, no, you can't. So of course, nothing to lose. Jump, home, jump uh, on Craigslist when I got home. Started looking around. Is it legit? Is it real? And interview with some companies, align myself with a company with really whose values aligned with me, but got the classic training. Here's a three tab. Here's a dimensional go make sales. Didn't know what, like, do I have to have a ladder? How do I put a ladder up? What do I look for? Where do I go? What do I say? I knew nothing. And uh, at that point I, I went all in and I literally jumped ship on the massage thing. I had two grand in my name, needed to make it work, set a crazy high income goal for myself at the time, at least, which was a hundred grand. And uh, ended up generating 140000 in my first eight months, laid on a storm, figuring it all out. First sale was actually a commercial property off a cold call. And then fast forward, ended up becoming chief operating officer of that company. Uh, we operated in five states, six cities, grew a sizable team, uh, helped create all of our systems and processes, and handled all of our legal stuff, marketing, sales, you name it. Um, and then from there, I, I frankly, I burned out because I was running around too much. And I realized I, I got so far away from my passion, which was helping reps succeed. So that's how this whole thing started. There's a few other steps along the way, but the fast version is I jumped ship, ended up on this side, as I call it. And my mission today is to help every single sales rep in the industry smash their income goal and give every customer an amazing experience. And for today, we're going to modify it since we got adjusters on the line. <laughs> So at the same token, it's about achieving the success that you set out to achieve while linking up a amazing experience or an amazing experience for the customers or the clients that we serve. Have you noticed that like teaching has always been sort of like a part of your life uh, throughout most of your adult life? Or is that something that you just sort of just all of a sudden just felt passionate about, just landed on? Huh. I have never once been asked that question. I love it. Um, and actually looking back when I was uh, studying these natural medicine modalities, I was, I was an instructor. So I guess I'd, I had been a teacher at that point, but outside of that, that was kind of my first foray into teaching officially is needing to learn a modality and being able to facilitate. Um, but communication was always a thing. I loved my, my passion. My, my true passion is 
connecting the dots versus what someone is thinking to what they need to articulate or say, and then how that message actually lands on the recipient, because those are a lot of drop-offs. So many reps that I've trained are like, oh, I'm saying this. And then we do role play. And I'm like, so what you think you're saying, you describe perfectly. The words that are coming out of your mouth are different. And the interpretation (laughs) of those of how they're landing is an eons away. So that whole connection is really the, what I'm passionate about teaching, but very, very good question. Well, there is a, the reason why I asked that is because it, it happened to me. I, I, I'm born and raised in Miami, Florida. Most of my life I lived there. And then at the eight, and I, and I was a tennis instructor for 15 years. I was actually full-time public adjuster and a full-time, I never say part-time anything. I was a full-time public adjuster and a full-time oh. tennis instructor for 15 years. Wow. And then uh, my wife had an opportunity in Tampa. We moved to Tampa and my tennis career was over. I didn't, I didn't want it. I, I was done. I'm like, I'm not, I don't want to go out there because I had myself a couple of tennis academies. I did everything that I wanted to do. Didn't get to where I wanted to get to and regards to tennis, but I was burnt. I was done. I'm in Tampa now. Let's go full all into public adjusting. And then I landed on this. And now yeah. I'm teaching again. Like when I thought my teaching career was over, <laughs> was full over. circle, I'm back Here again teaching now public adjusting. So I feel like for, I think it takes a certain personality and I feel like it's just like a certain kind of person. There's not a lot of us out there, you know, especially teachers who go out there for making 30, 40, 50, 60,000 dollars a year, not mm-hmm. making that much. I mean, you have to really enjoy it. You have to be really passionate yeah. about it. Agreed. So how did you get to, before we get into pitches and before we get into all of this stuff, YouTube and social media and all of that, what's the, what's the aha moment behind that? What's the story behind that before you started? For me, it was on a flight, literally, actually it was on a flight to Denver. I was on a flight to Denver and I needed a book to read and I landed on Crush It uh, by Gary V. And I was trying to come up with, uh, I had a travel channel with my wife. And I was trying to see how can I make this valuable? It's just a travel channel. We're not going to get a lot of views. We're not going to get a lot of subscribers unless I make it valuable. Maybe I could start selling photography. Maybe I could start giving photography tips. Maybe. And then I'm just like, I'm like, duh, I'm a public adjuster. I could just teach claims. I can teach public adjusting. And then when I got back from Denver a few days later, I literally set the camera up, which I already knew how to do all that stuff, sat in front of my desk and I went raw uncut because I didn't want to edit. So I was like, I'm just going to go, I'm going to, I'm going to call this the raw uncut, you know, claims channel, which was really, I just didn't want to edit. And I would just every Wednesday, it was a commercial claim show. And I only named it commercial claim. This is by the way, I don't know if anybody knows secret, full disclosure. I only named it the commercial claim show because I wanted more commercial claims. That was the only reason why. And, uh, and it just ended up just turning into a thing. So I don't know if your story is similar, but that's my story. Yeah. That's wild, man. It's funny how these things happen. Airplanes seem to be the source of epiphany <laughs> always. I've had yeah. almost all my big breakthroughs on a plane. I just pulled up my other monitor. I haven't actually read that book, uh, Crush It by Gary Vee. So it is now on my list and I'm going to listen to it. Um, So I tried to leave the roofing industry four times and I keep getting sucked back in. Burned out, left, ended up back in and then uh, left, started this brand, left and and then back again. And I've always stayed in in sales, by the way. I, um, but anyway, let's go back to that journey, how it started. When I started the roof strategist, um, which my wife named, by the way, we, we were driving down the highway. She's like, what about the roof stretch? That's a great name. So at that point, I was only working with a handful of clients one-on-one every single month. So we had a structure I worked with uh, usually owners or owners in leadership exclusively on scaling sales operations and personnel. And it started to just get too repetitive for me. It, it was... I really like to impact the lives of the team. And there's kind of two types of owners, those that just, that are um, information junkies that want it all. And then those that actually execute because not everyone actually implements. And I felt too many layers removed from being able to truly make an impact on the sales team. So I'm going through the same process over and over. And again, there's people that do this and it's needed. So there's no bashing this. It just wasn't a good fit for, for my passion. So I'm like, all right, how do I touch the lives of the reps? So all I did was I just started filming a couple of videos for my clients to share with their team. And there was no plan behind this. I didn't know Jack Diddley about tech. So I'm like, how do I get it on my website? So I figured out how to do like a password protected thing. I had to make them unlisted on YouTube and I just put them on there and I just gave my clients the login so they could share it. It was like three or four or five videos or something with their team. And fast forward a little bit. I decided I just wasn't enjoying working in this capacity, this style of, of serving companies. 
So I decided to stay in direct sales and I started a different brand. I got lucky. I landed some, some quasi celebrity clients. I worked with some, some, some authors. I worked with one of Oprah's top 50 most influential women. I worked with a, a, a membership organization that was just recently featured on Forbes as one of the fastest growing uh, companies in their space. Uh, so I got to work with in a fintech company that's had massive publicity. I still do some consulting with them here and there. But anyway, I stay in this direct sales side. So chapters closed on the roofing thing. All of a sudden, I'm like, you know what? Videos are there. Maybe they'll help someone. So I just changed from unlisted to public. Uh. That's how it started. People started watching. I didn't think anyone would care. I said, hey, if someone can benefit, why not? They're there. Let someone do it. And then people started reaching out saying, do more. And that's really what started to draw me back. So when I started doing more, I didn't even really have a plan. I'm just like, I just want to help people out. I want to help people use this industry because it, it, it absolutely changed my life. I developed into a new person. I started earning a healthy living. I learned that this whole business is personal development in disguise. You learn to communicate better. You learn to be more efficient with your time. You learn new skills. And byproduct is higher income. What other business can you do that? Otherwise, you just get a paycheck, right? Same right. paycheck, no matter how hard you work, how little you work. So that's how it all started. And uh, I just kind of fumbled my way into it. And how long, how long did it take you to really start seeing like, hey, like this thing is actually moving, this thing is actually going? Like, was there a tipping point or was it just, you know, just a daily thing? Oh man, is it a grind? Uh, it is. People don't understand. Oh, it is a grind. Uh, I started, the, the videos were first put up there in 2015. I don't remember the year that I started to do more. Might have been 2017. Um, it might have been. I mean, if you just go back and look at me, everything has a date, so you can see. So right. my memory is horrendous when it comes to time stamping things. But uh, but it it took a relentless pursuit, and growth is small, and uh, and patience. Yeah, there was really no spin up point. I think it was about 18 months to really get some traction of of very clear plan and relentless pursuit. And patience, right? A lot oh, yeah. Patience. Of patience. And also, I, I was kind of detached on what happened. I didn't do videos for views. I did them to help people. So I really, you know, to me, views are a vanity metric. Everyone, this is one thing I, by the way, we're talking social media. I'll tell you, I hate social media. I use it, but I think it's a massive distraction for most people. To me, I value time. I don't put up entertainment stuff. I think that's a joke. Why, why sit there and look for a chuckle? This is gimmick. I want to, if you're giving me your time, you're going to leave with some valuable insights apply to your life. That's just my own view. I'm a very opinionated person. So I don't care if you agree or not. I'm just telling you how I use social media. So well, to me, I've even found to date some of my best videos that, that bring in new customers don't have a lot of views because it's not about the views. It's like saying, oh, well, my ad got 20,000 impressions. Well, how many sales did you make? Oh, zero. Well, then no one cares. <laughs> well, and so, it's, not, it's not just about like just po posting a bunch of crap to make people, to, to distract people, or whatever it is, but yeah. it's also about posting value. And then you have also a lot of people that I, I'm also getting, I'm always just grinding on some of these public adjusters that all they do is say, hey, there's a hurricane in the area. You should call me if you want our services. Hey, there was a hailstorm. You should call us if you want our services. Like, no, you need to provide some value behind that. Don't just put an ad out there or just put a commercial, some video of, of your services and what you could do. Like, actually, why don't you provide some value? value behind that, maybe tell them, maybe once you give the person maybe five tips that you should do as soon as a hurricane hits, or maybe some ways to prepare for that hurricane before it comes, like provide some value in it and people will actually, you know, come back to you for more. Yeah. Simplest rule in marketing. No one cares about you. Right. Period. Make it about them. You want to put up a, an ad, talk about the customer. How can they benefit from this? What can they learn? If you put up things, if I put up a video that just talked about myself the whole time, <laughs> it's not going to do very well. No, no. All right. And so enough every, about you. <laughs> yeah. No one cares. <laughs> no, it, there's a tipping point, right? Like when you start to develop a brand and people want to get to know you, that's a different type of, of content, but you have to put your content into buckets. Discoverable content, meaning what, what people who aren't in your world yet need to learn or want to learn. Come on, camera, come back into focus here. Uh, there we go. Um, what they haven't, you know, excuse me, the information that's going to lead them to you. And then you have your engaging content with people. And then you have other content where you can have some asks in there. But I broke all the YouTube rules. I, I very seldom follow like the best practices on, on YouTube. And I just, I don't know. I've taken a very simplistic approach. 
of just helping. <laughs> How do you just help people? It's, that, it's, the easiest, it's the easiest thing to do. I mean, I have yeah. one rule before I, before I stand in front of the camera and before I provide any kind of, before I do any kind of content, I always just try to make sure I provide value every single time and bring it. You got to bring it too. That's something that Rico and I are always talking about how behind yeah. the camera, when you're in front of a camera, as opposed to in person with somebody, it's much easier for that person to feel your energy as opposed to yeah. when you're in front of a camera, you have to go a little bit above and beyond so that the people could actually feel your passion, feel your energy coming through the screen. So, Cause I've got buddies of mine. They're just like, Oh, you're a clown up there. Look at what you're doing. And I'm like, guys, you don't understand. Like if I'm just there monotone talking about some very valuable information about what to do in the claims process, then nobody's going to listen and nobody's going to watch. But if I come out like this and this is what you got to do, and this is how you get the claim going, this is how you get paid. People are going to listen. Yeah. It's got to be authentic because there's some people that are just so over the top theatrical on their effort. By the way, with that voice, NPR would be happy to hire you. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know about that. No, no, it's got to be authentic, man. You got to bring the energy and the energy has got to come from passion as opposed to so many people that I thousand percent overdo it. And they're just like, well, if I just use a lot of hand gestures, it's like, dude, now you just look like the flailing inflatable arm guy. Arm Uh, flailing inflatable too, man. Best episode of family guy ever. I know. Right. Glad you caught that reference. I haven't watched family guy in years, but everyone knows that one. You mentioned owners and leadership. You mentioned that you started with that as a business owner, as a owner of a public adjusting firm. Definitely something that I do. I feel that I need some training on. You know, I was able to grow my book of business. uh, Not I did door knocking in the beginning because we had Hurricane. uh, What was it? Hurricane Wilma in 2005, and then in 2008, I was out there door knocking. That was my door knocking experience for probably about a year and a half. I would just look for an area with tarps, and I'd go door knocking one after the other. Uh, I think probably a lot of people, unfortunately, well, would agree with sort of my original assessment of it, which was like, it fucking sucks. It's, yeah. it's, it, it's, it's really hard. It's really difficult. Um, but back to the ownership leadership model, um, what kind of tips can you give, I guess, to someone like me or a public adjusting uh, owner of a public adjusting firm on sort of building your sales team and making sure that you're sort of I guess, providing the right value to your sales team, encouraging your sales team, um, uh, encouraging them to, to go out there and door knock, go out there and find those leads. I, I do find that difficult. We've got, what do we have? We have eight adjusters and we've got a couple rock stars and then we've got a couple who are not rock stars. What are yeah. some tips and tricks that you've got maybe for someone like me or any other public yeah. adjusting owner or any other business owner with a sales team on sort of what we're to do to really encourage them and get them going? Yeah. There's three elements, what I call the roofing sales success formula. And this is applies to public adjusting just the same. In fact, you can go so far as say it may even apply to pretty much any sales role. By the way, this took me a long time to figure out. <laughs> there's there's three things. The B, the do, the say. The B is getting the right person who's a good fit for the industry and for your company. Okay. The do is doing the right sales activities every day. This is the greatest weakness at our industry at large. We hire people. We say, you can make a bunch of money. And they say, how? You say, go work hard. And it's hysterical. By the way, I laugh at this. I'm going to be, you're guilty. I'm guilty of this. So we hire people on and we're basically like, all right, I figured it out. But now you get to go reinvent the wheel. And nobody helped me do it. So you figured out, call me if you need Uh me, because that's what I used to have to do. Exactly. So it's, it's really not fair. Uh, and again, I'm guilty. I'm not judging anyone. I've done everything that I'm sharing these mistakes. I've, I've experienced, all right? I didn't come in and wave some magic wand and be like, oh, no, no, the perfect way to do this. No, I made, I made all the mistakes. I had the high turnover. So this is the greatest weakness is no one really knows what to do. So one or two things happen. They either work really hard and put in the time, but they're doing all the wrong things, or they have analysis paralysis and they've never been in this kind of role where they have this autonomy. So they just don't work and they don't realize what it takes. Cause you said knocking door sucks. It's not pleasant, but this industry is not, if, you, if anyone wants a pleasant job, this industry is not for you. If you're in this for comfort and stability, go find a desk job, go or be comfortable with your salary. No matter how hard or little you work, you can jump on your hamster wheel and work your way up your corporate ladder. The whole rest of the world is structured to support you. But if you want to write your own paychecks, this is a great place to do it, but it's not fun. If it was fun and if it was easy, everyone would do it. So that's the second thing is the do, doing the right sales activities every day. I'll go more in depth on these two in a second after I introduce them. And then there's the say, and this is what that individual says every step of the way when it comes to communicating with the customer or soon to be customer, whether that's at the door, if you're door knocking, whether it's presenting, overcoming objections and closing deals. So when you get the right people doing the right sales activity, saying the right thing, sales skyrockets, period. I've watched it happen. I have clients that went from 5 million to 20 million a year. Another one that's going from 12 to 20 million a year. Another one that's already doing 80 million and opening new offices. So go ahead. In a strictly commissioned job, 
obviously it's very important. I mean, that's one of the one of the core values is making sure in our company that we have the right people. People go through a very extensive process just to come work for us. But when it comes to a strictly commissioned job, what do you got to lose? Yeah. What do I got to lose from bringing somebody on when they're strictly commissioned? They're going to get paid based on how much they put in. Oh, a lot. You have a lot to lose. That's a horrible approach. Uh, one is just the, the human ethics. You can't have people jump on board and risk their livelihood. That is completely unethical. If you're a throw mud at the wall and see what sticks, go give yourself a hard look in the mirror because what you did is sold someone on a dream that you knew they couldn't achieve. They're working for you. It's a hundred percent commission. They're working themselves into a horrible place, burning through money on empty promises that they're not a good fit for. It is your obligation as an owner or manager to fire someone when they're not performing period. And by the way, I'm passionate about this because I, there's a gentleman on my team. His name was Joe. Joe sold me. Joe is a rock star in our interview said all the right things. And I'll never forget it. I was out on our first lead with him. He came from another company. I'm like, you're going to learn things our way. So we ran a lead that I got for him from a relationship I developed with an insurance agent, or excuse me, with a real estate agent. We're at the house. And I'm like, while we're here, let's go knock the doors. Like we got an in, like we can literally say, Hey, we're here because this house that's for sale next door, right there, their realtor refers us work while we're in the neighborhood. We couldn't help but notice blank, blank, and blank. Okay. You should have seen this kid. He went, he went white as a ghost. I'm like, you said you were a rock star. What? And then it clicked later. It took me a year. He was afraid to knock the door. That's what was wrong. Fast forward a year, he'd earned $20,000 of commission from us, got divorced, lost his house, ended up, he would have earned more money at McDonald's. And I have, I spent hours trying to save him from himself, having the, the, the moments, having a beer in the garage with him, man, you can do it. You can do it. And it was my, I, if I had fired him earlier, he probably wouldn't have lost his house. I let that happen. That's on my shoulders. And I carry that for a very long time. So the reason I say this is you cannot have that approach. If you're not qualifying people first and then having strict guidelines of what they should be performing so you can figure out whether they're going to succeed, that's your responsibility. And then if you want to add to that, it's also your reputation. I have also tried the, we have nothing to lose. They're commission only. And you try this, by the way, because that's what the industry does, right? If we turn and burn people. And then you start getting the phone calls of finding out after that rep is gone, the things they were saying. And this logo right here is in front of the customers that you might not have earned. And now those people talk and usually it's not good things. So to me, I'm not willing to risk that reputation with the wrong people. I'm not willing to put someone in harm's way. I'm willing to find, to put in the work to find the right people to grow. Does that answer your question? A uh, thousand percent. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, again, we go through a pretty extensive process. We have people take assessments and all kinds of stuff. So I do try to make sure that we hire the right yeah. person. Doesn't always work out that way. We do our best. Um, but in the beginning, it was more just like, come on. Yeah, let's go. Come on. Let's yeah. go. Give it a shot. Believe me, I did it too. <laughs> So these three pillars, the advice for owners, the be, the do, the say, when they're strong, sales skyrockets, period. When there's a weakness in one or more of these areas, which have different symptoms, by the way, you'll have the person who uh, just simply doesn't stick around or high turnover. You're hiring the wrong people. Not doing the right activities is usually due to low production volume. They're not bringing in the deals they should. Or sometimes you have the right person who's a closer that you can, if you get an inbound lead, a referral, an appointment, they're, they're going to bring that deal in. But they're lazy. They're, we call them lead babies. Right? Do you they just sit back qualifying back to qualifying the right person, getting the right person. Do you have like a strict set of, of things that you look at to, that, yeah. you know, that this person's going to get it and this person's not going to get it. Five profile traits, hustler, thick skinned, persuasive, persistent, and confident. These are the five. I teach this in my program, how to build your dream team. What I look for is I do an interview process. That's very different. So another, by the way, one of the key uh, reasons for high turnover is the hiring ad and the hiring experience. We often say, set your own hours, flexible schedule, earn what you're worth, all this stuff that basically says this is a gimmick. You can make a lot of money without working hard. So either people don't apply or people apply with completely unrealistic expectations. Let me ask, how many hours a week did you work when you first got going? Knocking doors. Endless. No, no, no. It was, I'm still to this day. <laughs> Yeah. Sun up, sun down, and then some, right? Yeah, so right. we set these crazy unrealistic expectations. There's a few other mistakes that are made. So what we want to do is run the right ad first, get people to call. Then when they're in, I don't sell the job. Everybody tries to sell the job way too soon, sell the opportunity, how much money can be made. Instead, all I want to do is I'd say, hey, Vince, 
this is going to be an interview process, probably unlike anything you've had before. And all I'm going to do is ask you to tell me stories. Now, why is that? Because most people know how to interview. Vince, how would you handle it if a customer yelled at you? Well, I would be just supremely respectful and I would do this, this, and this. Uh uh-uh. So instead, I'm, all I'm going to do is ask them to tell me stories because pe- when people tell you stories, they tell the truth. So I sit here with a piece of paper with the words, hustler, thick skin, persuasive, persistent, confident, written down. And all I'm doing is checking yes or no as I just continually ask questions. Hey, Vince, I just want to get to know you. You know, in this business, we deal with you know, people's homes. So tell me about a time you had a customer yelling at you, like the worst experience you've ever had. And then you're starting to tell it to me and I can hear all of the truth. Do you have thick skin? How do you deal with it? Were you able to be persistent in overcoming it? Were you persuasive? Are you looking me in the eye? Did you give me a proper handshake? Are you confident in how you communicate? And I'm literally checking yes or no. Hey, tell me about a time, maybe in childhood, where you really wanted something and you had to go achieve it. What was the biggest accomplishment you've ever had? Oh, I can't really think of one. Well, don't hire that person. They've never worked hard in their life. So through this investigation, people have a high likelihood of of being consistent in their behavior. Yes, people change. Um, I was not thick-skinned, by the way, when I got into this at all. I was the opposite. So there is some you know, you might make a game day decision on someone, but oftentimes hoping people are going to change. It's usually a one in 10 or one in 20. So to me, I just, I do that interview on that first. If they check all five boxes, now I'm going to move on to selling the position by prizing the company. Cause you know that they're shopping around because just like homeowners shop around or property owners shop around. So will that the person who wants to work for you. So then I learned how to sell them on the opportunity and then sell the quote unquote commission only, which by the way, is the language you should never, ever, ever use for any reason, because the word only is negative instability. This is where you get the, the person that says, I'd love to work with you. And then you get the call two hours later. So I got home and I talked to my husband or my wife and they said, I can't do this because they want X, Y, and Z. And I teach how to sell the job in a way that overcomes this by laying it out. So that's kind of the foundation. There's a little bit more to go, but that's the, the, the nuts and bolts of it. Gotcha. Gotcha. That's awesome. Okay. Okay. I like it. I like it. On to do right activities. Yeah. This is yeah. where I think it's going to be. I want you to get a little bit more specific when it comes to actual public adjusting firms and what yeah. we have to do. Do you have any questions guys- about, about us? Yeah. So what do you do every day? So as public adjusters, our job is a little bit, uh, it's not just, I guess, the sales per- portion. It's not just landing a deal. Once we actually do land a deal, we actually have to work the claim. We have to follow up with the insurance company. Uh, most of us actually do our own estimates. We put a, have to put an estimate together. Uh, we have to negotiate with the insurance company. We have to follow up with them. We have to fight with them. We have to write a lot of letters a lot of letters because we have to we have to sort of argue with anything that they're coming at us with. And uh, we're the quarterback of the insurance claim. We're the quarterback of the claim. We're, we're working directly with the roofer. We're working directly with the mitigation company. And then we're also obviously the main contact point with the, with the uh, homeowner. So after we land the deal, there's a whole lot of other stuff that still needs to be done. <laughs> yeah. So that's a very good question. I'll tell you this. I'm focused on sales. Okay. Uh, I'm not an operations guy, but what I can tell you from a sales standpoint is you don't have any jobs to process until you have jobs. Ain't that so, the truth? Yeah. So what I would do is two things. I'll bolt on what I would recommend because I know in roofing sales, it depends. Every company is different. The rep responsibilities are fluctuate between just sales, sales and production, sales, production, supplementing, cradle to grave, however they run it. Uh, number one is you need, to be, you need to know what you're going to do every day. So stepping back, the do, doing the right sales activities every day needs to be built around that individual's income goal. So if we are in a commission-based world, you are lying to yourself. If you think that your, your person is there to sell and make you money, they don't care about you. They care about them. They're in your company to make money for themselves, to better their life, to hit their income goals. So the way I lead a team is everyone, I am, I am the vessel to help you achieve your goals. So I want to know what that goal is. I have a spreadsheet and a calculator in my, in my program that the rep can enter in their average earnings or commission, their average close rate, and then how much they want to earn. And I charted out what you got to make, your goal, your stretch goal. And it literally breaks down the sales activities to follow daily based on reasonable metrics to rely on for the number of touches. Now, what I consider a touch is a contact, whether it's a door knock, a letter that's left at the door, a letter sent in the mail, a cold call, or various levels of outreach that might be networking, connecting with other centers of influence or referral parties, whether that's contractors for you guys, insurance agents, probably not for for roofers, yes. Um, 
uh, realtors and so forth. So they need to know, all right, if I, they need to have a visual path to making that money. Most people just say, oh, you just work hard. Well, I know when I, when I got into it, I was like, I want to make a hundred grand. I'm like, well, how the hell does that happen? How many jobs do I need to sell? How do I get to those jobs? And I had to kind of reverse engineer this stuff. So they need to have that path. After that deal is signed, then you need to have your, your process in place to know that deal flow. I plan my days the night before. Um, I think everybody should, by the way. Mine is a very short one today. There it is. Yeah, there's, there's that. Love it. I got Wait, two, why are I different got, colors? You got two colors. I got two journals. I got, I got one that, you know, I write what I'm grateful for. I write plan my whole day. I remind myself of my goals and the steps that I have to do to achieve right. my goals. And this is just morning pages. You know what that is, right? No. Uh, shit. Before, the, before it finishes, I'll remember the book, but it's a book about creativity. And, and she talks about uh, to, bring out your cre- uh, to bring out your most creativity that you can throughout the day. You basically want every morning to write about one, two, or three pages of just whatever comes to mind. You're not writing a book. You're not writing anything. And what it does, it sort of clears out your head. It clear, it's called The Morning Pages. There's a book. I forgot what it's called. What's it called? Is it, it uh, in the, artist the Artist Way? The Artist Way, that one. Yeah. I just never had to read that too. That's funny. I was actually doing that today. So I didn't know the name of that, but, but yeah, like there's, there's mine from today. Ah, my pen just popped out. Um, I do it all in one. Anyway, thank you for that. That's a good one. I'm going to add because a little but more I, structure would be super helpful. But I know what you're saying is, is like what I do. So my goal, I send them out 90 days, my own person. I mean, we have our, our, our company core goals and all, we have all that crap, but like for me personally, it's three every 90 days. And mm-hmm. what I like about this, this one is called uh, the best self journal. Uh, okay. It sort of, it gives you in the beginning of it, it sort of breaks everything down on how you basically uh, write your goal here. So you have the result goal and then the end result goal, the end result goal is very important for me to achieve because, but then you have progress goals, three of those to get you to the result goal. And then you have action and tasks based on progress goal. Number one, what three things you have to do. So basically you have like, like six steps that you have to do for each sure. thing. It's, it's a ton. I mean, actually you're like three, six, nine, 12 steps basically just to get to that result goal. And it's like you're saying, touches, doors that you're going to touch, then how many people you actually talk to, how many deals you actually sign, so on and so forth. I think that's where you're getting at. Yeah, it is. It's exactly it. By the way, th- thank you for that book recommendation. I'm going to shoot through that one too. Um, what you just described reminds me of Gary Keller's The One Thing. Uh, that's another simple. great one. Yeah. Oh, well, fine. you have a 10-year goal. What are you going to do this year to get to your 10-year goal? What are you going to do this month to get to your year mm-hmm. goal? What are you going to do this week? What yeah. are you going to do by tomorrow. And what are you going to do today to get to tomorrow? Yeah. Yeah. Love it. Goal setting to the now, as he calls it. Um, The uh, getting back to leadership in in the advice is each person on your team needs to see the clear path to earning what they want to earn. You need to be supporting them to do it. You need to be holding them accountable to doing it. You need to be able to communicate to them how that pay structure is going to pan out. So he or she can communicate that to this significant other. Because if you go, if they go home, honey, I'm going to make a hundred thousand, 200,000. I don't know what adjusters make these days. What, what's the limit? How much like realistically a sales rep for your company, top producer? What easy. Man. Oh, oh God, a sky's the limit. But I mean, easy. They can get to the six figures very, very easily, very, very easily. So, but you, it's funny that you mentioned that because this happened to me by chance. At the beginning of this year, I went through everybody, I talked with everybody, every, the, every one of the adjusters on like, you know, like I, some of them were working full-time jobs that they're quitting. Some of them are working full-time jobs that they're trying to get out of. Some of them have their own goals that they want to get to. Some of them were working previous jobs and they want to get at least back to what they were making there before. So I took those numbers. One was 75,000. One was like 100,000. Another one was like 185,000. And I broke it down. I have an average of how much we settle per claim how much our average fee is and how much based on their percentage that they get for that for that claim, how much they make on that claim. And all I do is just multiply it by two, by three, by four, by by 12 months, by four weeks, by whatever. And I and it was shocking because it was the first time I had ever done that. And it was shocking that I go to them, I was like, are you writing this down? He's like, yeah. Dun, dun. You know what that means, right? You only have to sign two claims a month. I'm like, two claims a month? Yeah, Dude, I want to come work for you. It's so easy. You can get there. And he was just like, wow. Week. Well, but then I figured out though, that's closing two claims a month. And remember, that's the problem with our business is that it can take anywhere from three months to honestly, very rarely, but three years to close some of these yeah. claims. But yeah. I noticed that at the end of the year, we had 40% more claims still open as opposed to the amount of claims that we closed. So we had 40% more claims signed than we had closed at the end of the year. 
So I said, okay, so, okay, you need to close two claims. Well, that means you need to sign four. Or if you, you got to close four, you got to sign, I don't know, six or seven. So he's like, okay, but now we have all, we had a weekly scorecard that we go through. So, but it was just amazing that with the final, when I finally broke it down like that, I'm like, to get to where you are at today, you only have to sign or close X amount of claims. Can you do that? Absolutely. I can do that. So yeah, the cool. ask, I love that. Get, get, having them take ownership of it is huge. They need to. So, but I struggle with make getting them to buy into the right activities. That's, that's probably my biggest struggle. I ain't gonna lie. I have a whole sales leadership flow to pinpoint that. And here's the easy answer. It's not actually that easy, but it's simple. Um, my sales leadership flow is a diagnostic tool to pinpoint what each person needs. Sales is like a staircase, step, 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 step. And you can't get to the top step without hitting every step there. You don't, there's no, there's no cheat code to like do a two-step skip in sales. There's just not. Uh, if you try, <laughs> customers reject you because it's forceful or they just didn't get there. So the number one question is, are you on track to hit your goals? If the answer is yes, no action needed. Give them a pat on the back. Hoorah, go do your thing. If you're not, question number two, are you doing the daily sales activities? If they aren't, I'm not going to spend any time with them because if they can't commit to doing the work, why in the world would I commit to holding their hand? This is like staying in a dysfunctional relationship. Everyone that's listening has been in one of those. Actually, I shouldn't say everyone. Every now and again, I met the person. I was actually out to dinner with someone the other day and after training this team. He's like, oh, I met, married my high school sweetheart. I'm like, you're one in a million. <laughs> so, but anyway, outside of the one person. Who yeah, but I'm it, sure even that relationship has been very dysfunctional throughout all those years. Right? There's, there's <laughs> things that have come up. So if they... If, if the answer is we're not on track, why in the world would I do anything else to coach this person? Because I can't determine if there's other things going on, if they're not doing the activities. So we just simply sit down and say, great, you're going to do those activities by this date. And then I'm going to do an accountability check and you can have fun with this. We want to control the environment. You can even have picture, take a picture of their knuckles on a door first thing in the morning. So, you know, they're out in the field. So I require the team to submit evidence, so to speak, take a photo of whatever is going to document that you're doing the work. I want to see it every day. And again, that just controls the environment because they can't cheat on that. I mean, they can, it might happen, but my point is if they come back in after a week review and they're not doing the activities. My one question is, why do you continue to put time and energy into them? To me, that's a very clear indicator that it's a B problem, the wrong person. If they're not willing to do the work, that's fine. They're gone because there's nothing that you're going to do that's going to make them want to work, period. So if you can't get them to do the work, they need to go find another job. And I know you're, but I'll lose my rep. Who gives a sh <laughs> It's a matter of time. They're just not going to last. I have never, ever ever seen long-term success from a rep who's not willing to do the work. The earlier you catch it, the more you're going to save yourself. And then that flow chart continues. All right. Oh, you are doing them. Now I need to get to the next layer, which is the say, the communication piece. And I have a flow chart to understand where that, that the initial breakthrough needs to occur from the door to the presenting of the overcoming objections to closing. So anyway, I am, I know I'm, I, I simplify this stuff, but I really mean it because of Re how many people I've been through. Go ahead. Real quick, with the do with the right activities, do you require the sales reps to 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 lay that out? Like, what are you going to do? What is it that you need to do? Or do you sort of give that for them? Oh, I do give you it give to them. Why okay. would I tell someone who's never done this before to prove to me what they can do? It's silly. You know what they need to do, how many doors right. they need to dock, knock, if they're knocking doors, how many cold calls they need to make, how many you know, what an average or reasonable close rate should be. And you can put together a daily plan. If you want to make a hundred thousand based on X fee schedule, you need X number of claims to get those claims. You need to be doing X, Y, and Z activities. Now, if people are doing that and not reaching that level, you know, it's a communication thing. You know that they're saying something wrong. They're not closing these deals and we can pinpoint that. If they're not even getting those appointments, what the hell are you going to do with them? You're going to sit down with them and help them ace their pitch when they can't even talk to someone. Waste of everyone's time. So, if, if they don't have a clear path, if they can't wake up in the morning and say, today I'm knocking 60 doors or 70 doors or 100 doors, if I don't know where I'm going, if I don't know what touch point I'm doing X, Y, and Z, you know, it's for you to sit there and say, hey, you tell me what you're going to do is ludicrous. They just need to have that path. And you say, are you doing this? Yes or no. Now, the one thing is if they're, if they're hitting their goals and they're not doing the activities, as long as it's legal, ethical, and customers are taken <laughs> care of, I don't care. 
right? Then it's like, hey, if you can knock one door, close the deal, do that once a day, you are golden. So I look at this as the weight loss plan, follow it till you lose the weight. <laughs> once right. you're in the right shape, you can abandon ship so long as you keep the weight off. Are the activities always surrounded by door knocking or do you have other, other ways for them to generate leads and generate business? Uh, for my plan, door knocking, direct mail, cold calling, letter leave behinds, insurance agents, realtors. So there's six methods. Now, many companies, so I'll give you an example. I just trained uh, a company out in the state of Washington and they said, Adam, when you're out here, we can't touch on door knocking because we have too many leads. Love it. They literally have too many leads. It's close 60% them. of those leads are referrals. The same thing in this company I just trained, or was it what today? Friday, this week. Wow, that was Monday uh, in Akron, Ohio. They're like, we're mostly retail. We do a little storm, but majority of our work is inbound leads. So just focus there. So you have to pair this with your company and where your lead sources come from. And if you don't have to self-generate, if you've got appointments that come in, you don't need that talent to be able to go knock doors. You need the talent to be able to convert that lead because every time that phone rings in the office, you can put a fixed dollar amount to it, which I recommend everybody calculate. And the number is not going to be a pleasant one to see. And you're going to take your leads very differently when you see how much that phone call costs you to how much the sit costs you to how much that missed opportunity costs you. Okay. So uh, I want, I know we're, I want to keep everything within time. Let's get into the say. So we did the B, uh, making sure that we're getting the right person, making sure we're qual qualifying the right yeah. person. I know you mentioned the five things, the a hustler and the other things that you said, I'm yep. sorry, <laughs> just That's go, right. go, real, go real quick. Hustler, thick skinned, persuasive, persistent, and confident. Awesome. Now we went through the do, making sure everybody's got the right roadmap, right? And they're touching enough doors and they're getting in and they're generating the leads and they're doing everything that they have to, to make sure they're doing the right activities to generate the sale. Now let's get into the say. Yeah. So we have three elements. And, and by the way, not everyone's going to do the door knocking, but you have your, your canvassing or door to door pitch. You've got your uh, presenting and, and then you've got your, by the way, some people group presenting and closing together. So we have canvassing, um, I'm going to switch here and make this one objections. And then we got presenting and closing. I apologize. I mixed up the order. Canvassing, objections, presenting and closing. I know objections might come any other way, but those are the three kind of pillars of our communication. I teach formulas and I'll just break those down. I know we've only got a few minutes. Slap is my formula for presenting at the door. Say hi and break the ice. Let them know why you're there. Ask an open-ended question. Wait for their response and then present to their answer. When you're dealing with a claim, Here's the biggest breakthrough I had. There's four stages of the claims process for the customer. No claim, which means they have no idea that they even have damage because the roof is fine. Or they're like, please tell me how bad it is. Then you have a partial payment. Insurance was out. You guys probably get a lot of these and it's a joke. And they either agree with the insurance. Oh, our insurance has our best interest at heart. We are taken care of. Thank you so much for stopping by. Or they're irate. I'm getting screwed, right? I paid my premiums. Denial, same thing. They either agree or they're mad. And then if they already have a check in hand, they often think, just give me an estimate. I don't need your services. So you need to know those are seven pitches. You need to know how to present to each of those answers to showcase the value and create the need for your services. If you go in and just say, hey, we can help you get the most for your claim and this and that, and they think they're already taken care of or have everything, there's three of those seven scenarios where you're instantly going to have someone say, don't need you. So you need to learn how to do that properly. Okay. Objection handling is my ARO formula, acknowledge, reassure, overcome. And you need to outline the top five objections that you see on a daily basis and learn how to apply that to train your team as well to be equipped to handling it. Because the newbies go out and, and then they'll hear, hey, our insurance was out. They already are just paying for uh, uh, some small repairs. And then the rookie salesperson says, oh, well, your insurance company's screwing you and you need our services to get you made right. We'll get you everything you deserve. And then they're like, my dad's my insurance agent who the hell are you? You just showed up. So you need to learn how to eloquently communicate. And then you need to learn how to present and close. And I teach a car, the car park formula, connect, assess, report, present, ask referrals and kickstart. I've applied this model, by the way, I've proven it in roofing. I've used it in a variety of other sales, auditing sales calls for attorneys, um, for coaching organizations, mem excuse me, organizations, membership organizations, uh, financial services, you name it. It has been applied in a variety of vessels. So you need to create that consistent process because otherwise people try to talk their way through the sale or wing it and it doesn't work. There needs to be a process to follow. So you just need to look at your pitching in three pillars or your communications, pitching, objections, and then presenting slash closing and, and have that pure process that everyone's equipped to address the true situations that they're going to face in the field, handle those objections, and then bring those deals home. 
going to, can I put you on the spot with an objection? Yeah, of course. Sure. Are you, are you sure? You might not be one you've heard. I, I, it's probably not, but that's the nature <laughs> of this game. So put it on me. So how much are you charging uh, for the claim? Uh, man, that's 20%. So you're taking 20% of my claim, right? Yeah. So whatever the insurance company pays to build back my home, you're getting 20%. I'm like, yeah, we're getting 20%. Well, what if I don't have enough money to pay you and pay the contractor to do the work? Yeah. So I have to ask you one question first, because I don't know how this, I'll be frank with you. I've never used a public adjuster in my life. So does okay. the contractor you work with eat that? Not necessarily. I mean, honestly, usually what we do is the way I do it is if I'm involved in a claim and I'm negotiating a claim and I'm going for top dollar, I always do my own estimate. I do my own inspection. I do everything on my own. Once I'm able to get to that point where sure. they're on the, we're on the negotiating table and they're making an offer and you know, I think the offer is good or whatever it is, I will actually go back to the contractor mm-hmm. and say, hey, here's what we got. We got the roof. We got this. We got this. They're offering this. After my fee, this is how much is left. Okay. Are so, you good? Are you good with this? So let me ask you one more question, then I'll respond. Have you ever had a claim adjusted, and the homeowner had to come out of pocket to get it done? Yeah, that's happened. How often and how much? Not very often, and it's only it's only. I mean, I don't know the exact amount, but it would be probably like maybe maybe ten or twenty percent that they'd have to come out of pocket. And so your entire fee? Pretty much. But I will tell you that, like I always tell people, we're always, always 100% of the time going to get at minimum 50% more or up to 800% more. Yeah, there it is. So the way I would use this is A, acknowledge, hey, I understand the concern that it appears like you're going to be paying us a lot of money. Reassure. I get this question a lot, then I'd overcome. Working with a firm like ours, whether you choose us or someone else, which by the way gives the illusion of control and empowers them to make the decision I, that's right for them, even I though you always you're I always say if you're gonna can you use us, just please for the love of God, yeah. use another public adjusting firm. Exactly. Whether you use us or someone else, yeah. here's what I can tell you. Ninety-five percent of the claims you work are paid in full and the homeowner or property owner is able to get all of the work done. We have a network of contractors and we do our very best. Let's talk worst case scenario because we always want to go use risk reversal. So we have best case scenario. You use us, we can get up to 800% more, which really isn't about, here's the other thing that I'll, t- I'll, t- I'll touch on that right at the end. We can get up to 800% more. So you're made whole, you get the roof that you deserve uh, compensated for the right way to factor in material, um, the manufacturer's recommendations, current building code, and to make sure the roof's done the right way. And then we'll hand that off to a contractor uh, that we recommend, or you can use one that you choose. Now, absolute worst case scenario, you have a couple of options on, on what you wish to do. You cannot do all the work. You could do all the work. And, and there's financing options to cover that on low monthly installments with today's rates. It is very, very, very rare. But I will tell you that that small amount later would be much less significant should you not choose to work with someone like us. And then the right. project starts. What's the number one complaint? Costs more. You get into the roof, you think you're set. And then there's all these surprises at the end that land on top of you. So working with us is actually a safer bet. Uh, excuse me, whether it's us or someone else is a safer bet. So that's first part. Do you find it a lot harder to work with people who are really just very experienced? I've been doing this for a long time. Like somebody like me, when I'll sit down in front of a potential customer and I'm just like, just sign the fucking contract. Trust me. I'm going to get you what you need. I don't even have to just trust me. Yeah. You know, one thing that I would share. Uh, so yes and no, because we just get too close to it. I'm the same way. I, I get, I'm meeting with my team tomorrow to talk about our brand messaging, or excuse me, tomorrow, it's Friday. Can't keep track of the days these days. It's Monday, uh, but I'm too close to it. And I look back often and I'm like, the hardest thing is to do it for yourself. So the one thing that I'll share that I think every That's adjuster funny. needs to focus on is when we communicate with property owners about the claim. And by the way, I think this, we're saving the, in my opinion, the golden nugget till the 11th hour here. We always talk about the money, never talk about the money. Money is emotional. Money is my money. Most homeowners, when they see that check come through 20,000, what's an average claim for you? Just for fun. About thirty to forty thousand. Okay, so you see, thirty to forty thousand dollar go in there, go in the account. That's a crap load of money. That's probably a thirty to fifty percent of an annual income like that. 
Yeah. We don't want that money in their account and it's hard to get back out. We also don't want to talk about, uh, we'll get you more because then they believe it's my money. I deserve it. So what I do is I break the emotional attachment of money and I say, I am not focused on what your roof costs. I am purely focused on the assessment of damage. And then I explain Xactimate because the reality is in every adjuster on here, I, I want to challenge you. Do you ever actually negotiate price? Of no. the line items? No, it's the bottom Never. line. I tell people all the time. Yeah, all the time. All you negotiate is line scope. items. We negotiate scope, but we don't negotiate Correct. the actual line items, right? Which is objective, which is to get X material RFG 300 off quantity. You could say, Mr. Homeowner, a third party software that the insurance company uses, we actually use the same one, sets the rate that you see, that dollar amount that fluctuates by month by zip code based on fluctuations in material and labor cost. I do not care what this is. When people come in here and say, I get you more money, it means nothing. What we do is prepare a buildable roof scope, meaning what will get done the right way. If anyone comes in here and says they can do your roof for X amount, it's doing you a disservice. What you need is someone to properly assess that damage. What we find is the insurance company does not assess properly. They write an estimate of people who are not fully equipped to be doing that. What we do is we comb through line by line and objectively document this, plug it into the software that they use, and then provide all of the supporting documentation, almost like a lawyer would. I don't know if you can say that because I'm not an adjuster and don't know about regulations, but almost like a lawyer would to validate why all this needs to be done. And then we make sure that that is handed over with crystal clear instructions of that contractor. So they don't cut corners and they do the roof the right way because there's an allowance in place to get all of these items done. So I would focus not on the money getting someone more. I would break that emotional attachment, say, we don't care about price. We are focused on the assessment of damage. That price comes out to develop. And then again, I already went through that and I know we're coming up on time here, but that's the, the main takeaway is to focus on that assessment over price to make people feel whole because otherwise they just think that you're some greedy person who's showing up trying to take their insurance company for money and then stick them with the bill. And right. I know that's abrasive, but you if challenge me, is that what's happening in their mind? That's exactly what's happening in their mind. And they also think that their insurance company is going to take care of them. Why would I need to hire somebody to take care of me? I try to explain to them that our, our role as an adjuster, a public adjuster is completely separate from the insurance company that we are here for you. I ask them no questions. Do you guys, do you ever do that? Asking oh, yeah. no questions? Yeah, like, do you know, do you know what the duties after the loss are? No. Did you know that the insurance company underpays on the initial initial payment? Well, I guess stay away from money, right? Uh, uh, did you know that you could file a complaint on the insurance company if they're not doing something? Did you know that you have to have a proof of loss provided within 60 days? Did you know that you have to take photos and document the evidence and provide that to the insurance company? No, 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 no. Well, we will do all of that stuff for you. Yeah. Highlighting their pain. Right. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Hey, Adam, I don't want to keep you here all day because I'm sh pretty sure we can go on all day with this. We probably I could, man. This was fun. I do appreciate you taking the time. Hopefully that we will meet in person. I'm sure we will. Are you going to Roofing Insights? The Roofing uh, Insights Conference, if he has one, I'm going to that one. Oh, uh, I spoke at that last time. If, if I did good enough, Dimitri will invite me back. We'll see. <laughs> uh, I'm probably going to... Dimitri's coming for my event here uh, next Friday. Oh, nice. So every, every few months or so, and next year, we're going to go all over the country. We have a commercial claims advocate meetup. It started off just as me going to the bar and meeting me, but now we have anywhere from 100 to 200 people at each of these events. Awesome. And it's, uh, it's, we do it about six times a year. We try to go all over the, we go all over Florida, but now we're going to be going to New Orleans this year. And we're also going to go to Dallas. And then next year, I want to get out to Denver. I want to get out to Atlanta and I want to get out to different places. So Very I would love cool. to have you at one of those, That's but yeah, awesome. Dimit Dimitri's yeah. flying down from Minnesota just for that next week. Should be cool. Yeah. Way cool. Tell him I said, Hey, I will. All right, Adam, thank you again so much for your time. And, uh, for everyone that's listening, I mean, he's not hard to find Adam Benson, Bruce strategist, YouTube, Instagram, wherever you could get that. Cause he loves social media. <laughs> I love using valuable time on social media to help you better your life. That's my key takeaway. So awesome. Vince, thanks a bunch for having me. All right, man. Thanks a lot. See you later. Take care.